Hey everyone, how's it going? Forrest here, again with another installment of my complete analysis of all of J.S. Bach's Krell harmonizations. Today we're looking at Jesu Leiden, Pain und Tod, which translates to Jesus' Suffering, Pain, and Death. What a gruesome title. This is a fairly straightforward chorale. We have something particularly interesting here in the middle of the second system, but other than that, everything's fairly straightforward, so we're just going to hop right into the analysis. So we have three sharps in the key signature. We start on A major, we end on A major. I reckon we're in the key of A major. We go from A major to E, E, G sharp, and B. That's E major, which is our five chord in the key of A. And then we get C sharp, E, A, and A, which is our tonic triad, A major, and first inversion. Now looking ahead, we do have a perfect authentic cadence in the key of E major, so we are looking for a point in which we modulate, and because A and E are so close to one another, uh, we have quite a large zone that we can choose to modulate between whenever, but I'm going to uh, modulate over this beat here after our next chord. We have, uh, after our A major over C sharp, we have E, E, G sharp, and B. That's our five chord, and then we have an A major chord, A, E, A and C sharp, which is our tonic triad, and I think we're going to go to the key of E major over this A chord. The reason why I'm choosing this right here is because this really does feel like a series of don uh, tonics and dominants just chained next to one another, and this feels like the end of that idea and the bridge or the beginning of a new idea where A is being repurposed as a predominant chord um, in the key of E. Uh, e major. However, all of these chords are diatonic to the key of E major, so really you could choose to modulate wherever you feel it's appropriate. After our A major chord, which is now 4, we have a passing 7th in the alto before we get B, B, F sharp, and D sharp. It's B major in root position, that's our 5 chord, and then we cadence on E major, E, B, G sharp, and E, which is our tonic triad in root position. Looking ahead, we have a perfect authentic cadence in the key of A major, and I think that our E major here is functioning as a chord that takes us back to the key of A major. It's now our dominant. Basically, perfect authentic cadence is in the key of the dominant, at least in many cases, or one of the cases that they can operate in, is sort of as like a pseudo half cadence where they end up just being five in the key that's following, which is the key of the tonic, but they have... Uh, a level of tonicization that makes them feel as if the uh, the dominant is the tonic. But after our five chord, we get B minor, B D natural, B and F sharp, which is our two chord in the key of A major. So we have some cross relations here in pretty close proximity. We have D sharp versus D natural. And then we have E, B, B and, sorry, G sharp, B, B and E, which is uh, E major in first inversion, which is five, six. We'd expect some type of tonic chord in close proximity to that, but interrupting our uh, resolution, we get a respelling of the chord. We get E, E, G sharp, and D, which is an incomplete E7 chord in root position. And there's no fifth. And this actually was a chord, I believe, in yesterday's chorale, where the figure base can reflect the fact that there's a seventh above the root and a third above the root. Okay, and then afterwards we get our tonic triad, A, E, A, and C sharp, A major. We have an anticipation in the melody here before we get D, D, A, and, sorry, I am really bad with clefs, uh, D, F sharp, A, and B, which is B minor 7 over D, which is uh, 2, 6, 5 in the key of A major. And then we have E major, E, E, G sharp, and B, which we know from earlier is our 5 chord, passing 7th in the tenor. And then we cadence on A major, A, C sharp, E, and A, making this a perfect authentic cadence. Looking ahead, we have a half cadence in the key of F sharp minor. So the rel we're moving to the relative minor. We're just looking for a point where that uh, transition is the most logical. We have another A major chord here, A, E, A, and C sharp. No need to reanalyze. We then have G sharp, E, B, and E, which is our five chord and first inversion. And then we get some uh, deceptive harmony here, F sharp, F sharp, A, and D. Kind of in a substitute for six, we get four six. This is D major over F sharp. And then we get E, C sharp, G, and C sharp, which is C sharp minor over E. 
it's a 3-6 chord. If you see this pattern here where we have a uh, diatonic step below the uh, chord that's um, that starts the sequence, you know what you might have on the other side of it, which is true for this case, or not necessarily true for this case, but it's there in spirit. We have D, D, F sharp, and B, which is a 2-6 chord. Uh, so we actually have some adjacent harmony here, 5, 6, 4, 6, 3, 6, and 2, 6, but 2, 6 is very similar to 4. If this B were an A, which is eventually where it resolves to, we would have had this sequence of 4, 6, 3, 6, 4 in root position, which is a, a relatively common pattern in Bach. We see it mostly with uh, 1 and 7 chords, but we see it with 4 and 3 as well, with some frequency. Not a lot. It's relatively uncommon with 4 and 3 actually, but we see it a ton with 1 and 7. But I think this uh, 2 chord is going to be our gateway to the key of F sharp minor. Uh, B minor in the key of F sharp minor is our 4 chord, so this is 4, 6. And then we get um, C sharp, D, F sharp, and A. However, I think this C sharp is an accented non-chord tone, and this is actually just taking our 4 chord putting it in root position and adding a seventh very similar to what we had here but in this case it's fully spelled so we'll just change the figure based to reflect in a, a fully spelled uh fully voiced root position minor seven chord seven five three and then we cadence on five uh c sharp g sharp e sharp and g sharp which is c sharp major the dominant in the key of f sharp minor Okay, looking ahead, we have an imperfect authentic cadence in the key of A major. And we're looking for a point to modulate back, which I think is going to happen over this F sharp minor chord. We have F sharp, F sharp, C sharp, and A, which is our one chord in the key of F sharp minor. And in the key of A major, it happens to be our six chords. So we have a common chord modulation here, in my opinion. And then we have E major, E, G sharp, E, and B. B, which is our five chord in root position in the key of A major, and then we go to A major, A, A, E, and C sharp, which is our tonic triad, normative progression, very smooth transition between the two keys. We then get G sharp, B, E, and C sharp. This is kind of an interesting figure. You could make the argument that this is a C sharp minor seven chord, which would be three 4-3 in this case, because the fifth of the chord is in the bass. However, I think this C-sharp is an accented non-chord tone, and it's really this D and this E right here that are impacting the chord progression with more heft. And I think this is actually a 5-6-5 five, five chord. Uh, E7 over G-sharp, or even a 5-6 chord I think would be an appropriate analysis here, because the seventh is so fleeting. But the difference between 5-6-5 five, five and 5-6 uh, is fairly negligible in this case. I don't think it really comments too much on the chord progression. But I think 3-4-3 three, could also be an accurate analysis. The difference between 3-4-3 three, three and 5-6-5 five, five is uh, very small. But after our 5-6-5 chord, we get F-sharp, F-sharp, A, and D. That's D major over F-sharp, which is 4-6. And then we get G-sharp, E, B, and D, which is uh, a pattern that Bach uses a lot where he carries over the uh, the common tone between the two and the five chord or the four and the five chord in this case we see four six going to five six five this is e7 over g sharp and this is a relatively common permutation of uh, cadential chords that we get in imperfect authentic cadences in bach and then we cadence on a major a e a and c sharp tonic triad looking ahead we have a uh, pretty close counterpart to the previous phrase. We have another imperfect authentic cadence at the end of it in the key of A major. Uh, so we start things off with an A major chord, and I'm going to go ahead and rewrite it. Typically when we have two chords that repeat, like in this case right here, one going to one, I'll leave the chord blank because there's no reason to reanalyze if the same chord is recurring. However, when we go to a new line, I think it's a nice gesture to continue the idea. That's just me. You don't have to do that if you don't feel like you need to, but that's just a uh, just a gesture that I've picked up in my time uh, analyzing scores. But after our tonic triad, we get F sharp, D, A, and D, another 4-6 chord. This is D major over F sharp, and then we get C sharp, C sharp, A, and E. A bit of a plagal progression. We have A major over C sharp. Then we get... Uh, 
D, B, A, and D. Kind of an interesting chord here. This is B minor over D, or sorry, B minor 7 over D, which is 2, 6, 5. It is incomplete. Typically, we would expect a complete spelling. At least that's what my intuition is telling me, kind of like in this case here. However, we are closing in on a cadence, so a 2, 6, 5 chord is expected in this situation, I feel. Um, after our 2, 6, 5 chord, we get E, C sharp, A, and C sharp which is A major over E, which is a 1-6-5 chord. Passing tone in the tenor before we get E, E, G sharp, and B, which is our 5 chord, 1-6-4 going to 5. Sometimes we use that bracket to show their uh, relationship with one another and how they're often found in pairs. Not always, but I'd say honestly in most cases that's where you're going to see a 1-6-4 chord in a cadential context, which is why it's been called the cadential 6-4 by many textbooks, um, at least the textbooks that I came up reading. And then after our five chord, we have A, E, A, and C sharp, which is our tonic triad root position, A major. Okay, looking ahead, we have another phrase similar to our first phrase where we cadence in the key of E major, and we're looking for a point in which we modulate. Now, I reckon it happens before this D sharp. I suppose it could happen after the D sharp, but this is one of those cases where it does. It feels like there's enough time for the modulation to um, pan out before the chromaticism is introduced. Uh, so we go to a five chord here, E, E, G sharp, and B. It's E major. Passing tone in the bass, and then we get G sharp, B, E, and B, which is taking that same chord and respelling it, inverting it, basically, putting it in first inversion. And I think that this is where we go to the key of E major. This is now our tonic triad in first inversion. And then we get F sharp, A, A, and C sharp, which for all intents and purposes could be a two chord. That's totally fine. But I think this C sharp is actually an accented non-chord tone. It's this D sharp that's more interesting. I think this is D sharp diminished over F sharp, which is a 7-6 chord. And this is a pattern that we see a lot in Bach. Um, very similar to the pattern that we had going on here, but it just turned into adjacent harmony um, as a result. But it's the same idea where we're taking a chord, we are then bridging the gap between the chord and the chord two beats from now with a chord that is a diatonic step below it and in first inversion. So here we have 1, 6 going to 7, 6 going to 1, E, B, G sharp, and E. Very common and consistent pattern in Bach. I find that this particular pattern occurs just as much in the opposite direction as well. So it's a pattern that we see with four chords. It's a pattern that we see with three chords. Um, we, we, hypothetically speaking, you could do it with whatever chord, but it's a pattern that sees frequency um, in a lot of the chorales. Interesting stuff. We then have A, C sharp, F sharp, and E, which is F sharp minor 7 over A. That's a 2, 6, 5 chord. Bach loves 2, 6, 5 chords in cadential situations especially. And then we have B major, uh, B, B, F sharp, and D sharp. That's our 5 chord in the key of E major. And then we cadence on E, E, B, G sharp, and E. And now for the maker's mark or the, the hallmark, the chef's kiss of this particular chorale, this three chord sequence here at the beginning of this phrase. Now the way that I have this analyzed as, as a direct modulation to the key of D major, which is a distant modulation, it's two notches uh, to the left on the circle of fifths. Um, but we have here it is some mode mixture in the context of D. We have G, B flat, G, and E which is E diminished over G. It's another 2-6 chord. Bach loves 2-6 chords. And then we get A7 incomplete, A, A, G, and C sharp, which is our 5-7 chord in the key of D. And then we get D major, D, A, F sharp, and F sharp. But as you can see here with these passing tones in the inner voices, this is a very brief modulation, and we are moving to the key of A major to prepare us for our final phrase, which is presumably going to be in the key of the tonic. So this D major chord is now our four chord in the key of A. And we also have a bit of a passing chord here. We have a D, B natural, G sharp, and F sharp, which is G sharp minor seven flat five, second inversion, so seven, four, three. 
or just a seven chord doesn't really matter it depends on how you view the role of the bass in this situation if you feel like the upper voice sort of supersede the role of the bass that's totally fine because the bass is effectively acting like a pedal underneath these two tones here but i tend to keep the bass intact if it is a chord tone um, if the bass isn't a chord tone, unless there's a real necessity to put the analysis on the page, I won't. Uh, but in this case, all of the tones contribute to a chord, therefore the chord's going to make it on the page. After our 7-4 chord, 7-4-3 uh, chord, we have A major over C sharp, C sharp, C sharp, A, and F sharp. But I reckon this F sharp is an accented non-chord tone, and this is actually 1-6, but I suppose you could analyze this as 6-6 six, six as, or 6-6-4 six, six, as well, but I think that's a little less likely than a 1-6 chord, especially after a 4-7-1 progression. Probably the most common subdivided progression in all of the chorales is 4 going to 7 going to 1. Pretty cool. Uh, after our 1-6 chord, we get B, D, A, and D. I think this is another case where we could have a potential 2 chord, um, which would be B minor 7, actually, incomplete, just like we saw earlier. Where was that incomplete 2-7 chord? I know we saw one earlier. Um, right here, we saw an incomplete 2-7 chord, or we saw an incomplete 7 chord here, um, and we saw an incomplete 7 chord here. But here, um, I think the A is actually a 7-6 suspension over the bass, or part of a 7-6 suspension over the bass, and this is actually G-sharp diminished over B. It's a 7-6, and this is creating another one of these patterns that we saw earlier, 1-6-7-6-1, six, six, because we're going to have A major on the other side, A, E, A, and C-sharp, which is our tonic triad. See, this pattern is very common in Bach. I'm not just cherry-picking this chorale. This is something that's pretty exciting because of how much frequency it gets. It's like one of Bach's little monikers. Uh, but we get an anticipation in the melody, which uh, gets us ready for... Sorry, I was so excited about the phrase, I didn't tell you that this was a half cadence. Um, we cadence on five here. But looking ahead, we have a fairly straightforward phrase, ends in a perfect authentic cadence in the key of A. We start the phrase off with A major, A, E, A, and C sharp, which is our tonic triad. G sharp, E, B, and E, it's five, six. Uh, e major over G sharp, and then we get F sharp, F sharp, A, and D. Bit of a deceptive progression here with four, six. We saw this earlier as well, 5, 6, 4, 6, and then we get E, F sharp, A, and C sharp. That is an unusual chord for sure. This is uh, 2, 4, 2, F sharp minor 7 over E. Kind of an unusual chord, especially happening after a 4 chord as well, because 4 and 2, 4, 2, I would imagine, they really function the same way. They're both predominant chords, and in this case, they're functioning as a pre-secondary dominant, which doesn't really comment too much on the the chord itself, but it's interesting. Um, I guess this F sharp minor could be viewed as, oh, you know what? What am I talking about? This is not a 2-4-2 two chord. This is a 6-4-2 chord. Apologies. I was thinking that this was a 4-2 chord. I'm not crazy. It's a 4-2 chord or a 2-4-2 goodness, a 2-4-2 two, two chord, because if we look at the next chord, we have B, um, we have an anticipation as well, but we have B7 over D sharp. That's a secondary dominant. That's 5-6-5 five, five of 5, because B is the dominant of E, and E is our 5 in the key of A major, and then we go to E major, E, E, G sharp, and B, which is our 5 chord. So this sequence right here of 6-4-2 going to 5-6-5 five, five going to 5 is, this, is a roundabout way of saying 2-4-2, two, going to 5-6, going to 1 in the key of E major. So I wrote 2-4-2 two, two because I was looking ahead and seeing that this fragment was in the key of E major if it was isolated out of context. Um, it's my jazz brain thinking about 2-5-1s just being linked together in many standards. But uh, yes, no, I think we're still very much in the key of A major here, and this is exactly what it looks like, a secondary dominant. I suppose you could analyze it as a modulation, but I think it would be harder to um, defend the quick modulation back to the key of A. After our passing seventh here, we have A, C sharp, E, and A, which is our tonic triad, how we would expect a crowd to end, and that is today's analysis. Fairly straightforward. I'd say this uh, mode mixture, distant modulation, brief modulation is probably the most interesting part of the chorale. Other than that, lots of ones and fives. 
fairly straightforward. Um, actually, this little bout of adjacent harmony here is pretty interesting as well. I think also, I know it's a coincidence because of how I formatted the page, but the fact that they happen in similar uh, parts of each respective system is a visual element that's pretty interesting. Uh, but other than that, I think that's all that I have to say about the corral for today. Thank you so much for watching the video and supporting the channel by doing so. If you're interested in following me along on the journey to analyze all of JSBox corral harmonizations, feel free to subscribe to the channel. You could also hit the notification icon if you want to be notified of my daily upload. I would love to have you along on the journey. Also, like the video if you enjoyed the video. It means that my videos are going to be uh, viewed by more people. We can grow the community and bring more people together through analysis and help people out, which is the point of the channel and what I'd love to do. But again, thank you so much for watching the video and supporting the channel by doing so. I look forward to tomorrow's analysis, and I hope you take care.